Is it possible that this is actually what our planet looks like? A flat circular disk with the sun rotating overhead not very far above the Earth. See the continents, how they are laid out there? The sun creating day and night. The daytime is when the sun is right overhead and the nighttime is when the sun is on the other side of the flat disk. Take another look there. This video is by Rob Skiba. Night and day in the flat earth model. Feel free to check it out for yourself. Look closely and imagine if this could be earth. So is this actually possible? Is it rational, reasonable, conceivable, supportable by verifiable evidence and common sense that our world could conceivably be a flat disk instead of the globe, the sphere that we are also familiar with? No, it is not, as I will be explaining in the course of this video. So I want to start off this video with a couple of things in introduction here. The first is that I made a video debunking the flat earth a little over a year ago, and not surprisingly that got a lot of uh, criticism and debate and uh, lots of thumbs down uh, from flat earth believers. And I wanted to do a more comprehensive uh, and more decisive video fully debunking the flat earth um, for a while, and so now I'm finally getting around to it. But I wanted to preface this by uh, making it clear that I am a truth seeker. Um, let's dispel with all of the, you know, you're part of the Illuminati plan and you're just a, you know, cover for uh, the powers that be and all this kind of stuff. Um, let's look at the facts, the evidence, and see what actually reasonably, rationally makes sense here. I am going to make an assumption that you are a reasonable, uh, common sense, open-minded person who is interested in the truth, whoever you uh, may be watching this video, and that you are sincerely interested in the facts and um, what the actual configuration of our planet is. This is a great opportunity for critical thinking and rational, reasonable um, analysis of the evidence, and that is what I'm going to present here uh, to you. Now, an important point that I want to make here is that nothing that I'm going to provide here as far as evidence uh, that debunks the flat earth and or supports the sphere globe earth theory is NASA photographs, video evidence, um, testimony from astronauts, etc. None of that will be factored into this video. I'm only going to include um, real life experiences evidence based on personal observation and experience that you can test out and uh, observe and uh, try out for yourself against the flat earth and the globe earth theories. This is only going to be um, based on uh, real observable, uh, verifiable evidence that you yourself can utilize um, in coming to your own determinations. And then secondly, I want to point out that when it comes to the potential models for the flat earth theory, then the one that I showed you there by Rob Skiba of a uh, flat circular disk with the sun circling right overhead is kind of the only model that you can use. It really doesn't matter what the actual shape of the flat earth might be, whether it is circular or square or a diamond or um, a heart or a four-leafed clover or whatever, as long as it is flat, then it has all of these same problems. The fundamental problem that you have when trying to come up with any other sort of configuration model for the flat earth is that the sun must be close to the earth. If you make the sun farther away, then it would be shining on the entire uh, surface of the earth all at one time, and then you have no explanation for day and night. The only way that you can explain day and night, sunset and sunrise, in any sort of way that you can maybe kind of sort of, you know, accept, is by making the sun close to the earth, and then saying, well, night is when the sun is on the opposite side of the flat um, plane of the earth, 
and so the light is not properly reaching over to the other side of the earth which in itself makes absolutely no sense um, but uh, we will get to um, dissecting that more later but basically if you're going to say that the earth is flat then you're going to have to say that the sun is very close to the surface of the earth and so in debunking that video there then I would uh, assert that I am debunking any possible flat earth theory. And so jumping now to the evidence. Number one is an example based on personal experience that anybody can recreate themselves. And I think this um, example alone is something that, for one thing, anybody can relate to and understand and is so practical and so just obvious of a massive problem for the flat earth theory that uh, I think this alone will convince many people that uh, the flat earth theory is just completely wrong and uh, absurd. So here's the deal. I have conducted this experiment myself many times and it involves flying in an airplane. So the way that the uh, flat earth theory uh, explains day and night and sunset and sunrise is like this. It is called the law of perspective, as they say. And so when you watch the sunset, then it might appear to you that the sun is being obscured by the horizon. Say that you are watching it um, in California or elsewhere on the western coast of the United States, looking out at the ocean where you have a clear view of uh, the horizon and the sun comes down and appears to uh, fall below the horizon and then you can no longer see it. And so what the flat earth believers would say is that this is just an illusion of the sun essentially going too far out of your view and just the reality of the uh, flatness of the earth and the fact that uh, you could not see forever on the earth even if it was flat. And so you have the sun that is moving away from you and the ground moving away from you and at some point they simply inevitably converge and then that is why the sun appears to set and so the sun is not going behind the earth as we would say in the sphere of believing community it is simply going off too far away and it then appears to be obscured by the horizon but it has just simply um, gone out of your field of vision essentially now there are lots of reasons why this doesn't make any sense at all, but following is an example that will illustrate clearly why this is absolutely not uh, happening and is completely uh, impossible. So the flat earth theory says that the sun is very close to the earth. There are many flat earth believers who actually think that the sun is so close to the earth that it is actually getting tangled up in the clouds. There are videos of people uh, showing the uh, clouds are both in front of and behind the sun, so it appears in this video, and therefore um, the sun must be just like right there in the cloud there. Now you can disprove this absolutely for yourself by flying in an airplane. So you hop in an airplane, you take off, get off the ground, and it doesn't take very long at all before you are up above the cloud layer. You will also notice that the sun does not appear to get any larger. And so obviously the sun is uh, a fair amount higher than the cloud layer. Now let's take this to another level and go on a long flight, an extended flight, such as over the Pacific Ocean, which I've done myself uh, many times. Those flights fly at a altitude of 30 to 40,000 uh, feet. That is higher than the peak of Mount Everest. Whatever the exact number is, then you can know for yourself that it is a very, very high um, height that you are uh, up there in the air because you can look out your window and see the clouds way the hell down there, um, way, way, way below the plane that you are flying in. Meanwhile, you can look up, assuming that it is the middle of the day, and you can see the sun up there, and guess what? The sun still has not gotten any larger. And so therefore, based on your own personal um, subjective experience, then you can conclude with certainty that the sun is very much higher than the cloud layer. So let's just take those numbers as they are. Um, it makes perfect sense just using your own observation that uh, the plane is, you know, let's say 30,000 feet up in the air. That is about uh, six miles. And 
the sun is much, much higher than that. Now there's a second thing that you can do here that will fully debunk the idea that uh, the sun setting is a result of the law of perspective, as they say, which is that you can watch the sun set from that same airplane. And I've done this many times myself. You're flying over the Pacific Ocean for hours and hours. It takes, you know, 14 hours to fly from San Francisco to um, Hong Kong, say. And in the course of that very same flight, then you can watch the uh, sun high overhead and you can watch it slowly come down and eventually set and then um, it gets completely and utterly dark. How is that possible on a flat earth? And so here you have the flat disk of the earth. Your airplane is somewhere here, just above the surface of the earth. And the sun, as we have concluded, is quite a bit higher than that. So it's somewhere up here, circling above the earth. And you are down here. How in the world can you possibly watch that sun set, go behind the horizon, if it's way up here, and you're down here? How does that possibly work? That is completely and utterly impossible. Because the whole model hinges on the necessity of the sun being very close to the surface of the Earth. And so as I've shown in that example there, then this cannot be the case that the sunset is a result of the law of perspective as they say, because it simply uh, is not possible that the sun could be setting simply as a matter of your perspective because as soon as you change your perspective, go much higher, then the same thing happens. If you are that high up in the air, and the sun is remaining above the earth at all times, then you should still have a perspective of the sun from that height. You should still be able to see the uh, sun, even if it is on the other side of the um, flat disk. It might be smaller, but it should still be visible. At the very least, you should be able to see it with a telescope. How is it possible that the Earth could become completely and utterly dark simply because the Sun is a little bit further away on the other side of that flat disk? There are so many reasons why this model simply does not make any conceivable sense whatsoever. But this, my friends, is only reason number one. So let's go on to reason number two. And so when it comes to considering the possible um, shapes and configurations of our uh, system of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and how they relate to each other, then you have to consider a variety of factors of real-world phenomenon that we all can witness and experience for ourselves that must factor into and make sense within that model that you are asserting is what is going on. Of course, there have been debates for uh, centuries about the shape of the Earth and um, what the stars are, what the sun is, what the moon is, um, and all this. So it has been an ongoing debate and a worthy one. But you must factor in these phenomenon that are undeniable. So here we go. This is a list I have of 12 phenomenon that you uh, must consider. So number one that you obviously cannot deny is day and night. Number two is sunrise and sunset. So I've touched on uh, both of those uh, phenomenon already uh, so far in this video. Number three is temperature extremes at the poles. So I lived in Alaska for a couple of years and I experienced the extreme conditions that they uh, go through there, winter and summer, winter when there is almost no light, summer when there is uh, full light. I lived in Fairbanks, Alaska at the center of the state and experienced for myself the extreme temperatures of 50 below zero Fahrenheit and witness for myself the sun rising at 10 in the morning, skimming the horizon and then going down once again around three in the afternoon. And this is in complete and utter contradiction to the flat earth model. If you look at that uh, model there, then it provides no explanation of how this is possible of how it is that in certain places on the planet you could experience extreme uh, lack of sunlight and extremely cold temperatures while simultaneously at that uh, very same moment then somewhere else on the planet would be having a completely and utterly different scenario going on you know 100 and 
510 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that, and full blaring sunlight while Fairbanks, Alaska is uh, in the grips of a you know, harsh, extreme uh, winter of 50 below zero. And so number four on this list here is differing angle of the sun at different latitudes. And I just touched on this on the last uh, um, example there. Number five, sun setting at different times depending on your longitude. And so you can be watching the sunset in San Francisco, California, looking out over the ocean there. You watch the sun set, and then you can call your friend in Hawaii, and they can confirm to you, I can still see the sun. So you have to be able to explain that properly in your model of the Earth. Number six, the seasons. Number seven, equinoxes. Number eight, eclipses. Number nine, cycles of the moon. Number 10, movement of stars in the night sky. As you watch the uh, stars in the uh, sky at night, then it is easily observable by anybody that they move throughout the night. And so what causes that? If we are on a flat disk looking up at the night sky, why is it that the stars are moving overhead? And so number 11 here is different stars in the northern and southern hemispheres. So in Australia, they can see something called the Southern Cross. The Southern Cross is a constellation of stars that is completely invisible to us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Why is that? Why is it that people on one side, you could say, of the planet, if it is a flat disk, then looking at that map of Earth, then the Northern Hemisphere, as we call it, is at the center of that circle. The Southern Hemisphere is on the outer ring of that flat circle. Why is it that the inner part of that circle sees a completely different configuration of stars than the outer ring of that circle that is all looking straight up? That completely and utterly defies all common sense. And finally, number 12 is 24-hour day and night alternating at the poles throughout the year. Now, of course, in order to verify this for yourself, you would have to go to one of the poles, which is not exactly easy. But as I uh, mentioned already, I've lived in Alaska, and so I've experienced the extremely low angle of the sun in the winter. And just by, you know, common sense and reasoning and deduction, then I can uh, pretty well convince myself anyways that if you keep going further north, then it makes sense that uh, the pole there is going to be somewhere where you are not going to be able to see the sun at all, or, or barely at all. And so you have to explain this one way or another. How is it possible on a flat Earth, with the sun going overhead like this, that the North Pole, right at the center of that circle, cannot see the sun for a good part of the year? How does that make any sense? And so these are 12 phenomenon that you simply have to factor into uh, your consideration of what the Earth is and its relation to whatever exists out there beyond the Earth, the moon which we can observe, and the sun and the stars. And so here is something that you must consider when comparing the sphere Earth theory on one hand versus the flat Earth theory on the other hand, which is that the sphere Earth theory explains all 12 of those phenomenon perfectly. Simply, perfectly, makes absolute sense, with no contradictions. You can uh, look at that uh, model of the globe Earth and the moon revolving around it and the sun off in the distance, which we are revolving around, and the stars that are even further away, and it all makes perfect sense. And then meanwhile, you look at the flat earth theory, and there are contradictions galore with almost all of these um, phenomenon that uh, it just completely does not make sense, that it's completely opposed to it, that there's no rational explanation for how this could be happening on a flat earth. And so compare those two things and think to yourself and ask yourself, what makes more sense? You have this incredibly, incredibly complex series of phenomena that are going on simultaneously that you cannot deny, that you can observe, witness, experience for yourself that are definitely happening all at the same time. And 
And here we have a theory, the sphere of the globe, that explains all of those phenomena perfectly simultaneously. And then meanwhile, you have this flat earth theory that does not explain these properly. You have to struggle to try to make sense of any one of them at a time. Not to mention all 12 of those synchronistically, simultaneously occurring within that model. And so the next proof involves taking a closer look at the sun. So let's look at that model again and look closely here and consider this. And so you have the sun revolving overhead, just skimming basically above the flat earth. Now, what is the obvious uh, noticeable difference between that sun and the sun that is believed to be 93 million miles away? It is much, 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 much smaller. It is actually smaller than the earth, quite a bit smaller than the earth. And so the fundamental question you have to ask yourself if this is uh, the way that the flat earth has to be with the sun that close to the earth is, how in the world could a sun of that size last for any significant amount of time whatsoever? What sort of magical, mysterious, you know, physics bending um, substance could that sun possibly be that it could last for thousands, millions, billions of years? Even if you are a fundamental Christian and you believe that the earth is, you know, 6,000 or whatever years old, how long do you think that sun realistically is going to last? A, you know, burning, blazing fireball, a fireball that is so essential to the earth that it actually supports all life on this planet. If you just consider photosynthesis and the fact that, you know, um, you can't grow a plant in absolute darkness, right? Anybody can do this experiment for themselves and uh, realize that this is the case. Plants need sunlight in order to grow, and all life on Earth is either plant life or animal life that supports itself on plant life, or else animal life that supports itself by eating animals that themselves um, supported themselves by eating plant life. And so all life on the planet is dependent on photosynthesis, the sun shining down upon it, the sun radiating this uh, energy and this heat that sustains our planet here. And so consider that blazing fireball that is blasting out all that uh, heat and light. And look at that tiny, tiny little sun and ask yourself, how long do you really think that could possibly last? How long can that thing keep emitting um, light and heat like that before it just fizzles out? I mean, I would be surprised if that thing there could last for, you know, more than like a couple days. I haven't done the, uh, you know, math on it or whatever, but uh, that thing is certainly not going to last um, years. It's not going to last hundreds of years. It's not going to last thousands of years. It sure as hell isn't going to last millions of years. That sun is completely and utterly unsustainable, impossible, absurd, ridiculous, not to mention your question of, well, why doesn't it fall to Earth like everything else um, due to gravity? But just asking yourself, how could that sun possibly last for any significant length of time will tell you that this model is impossible, unsustainable. It simply cannot be like this. And the flat Earth model is dependent on a tiny sun that is rotating just above the Earth. So that there just completely disproves the flat Earth model. And so the next proof for the globe Earth versus the flat Earth is the example that I gave in my last video about this uh, a year ago. And I'm going to try to uh, capture this argument um, in a much more brief uh, explanation than I did in that 30 minute video there. So the um, argument is the navigation argument. It is that for 500 years now, since Magellan sailed around the globe in the early 1500s, then it has been accepted by the world that the Earth is in fact a globe and is not flat. People have been navigating the planet very successfully, obviously, for the past 500 years based on the assumption that the planet is a globe and is not flat. Now, the fundamental problem that you have when you try to compare the uh, globe Earth map, if you will, versus the flat Earth map, 
is that the configuration of the continents cannot be the same. The problem is a fundamental contradiction between the third dimension and the second dimension as far as uh, space goes. So you simply cannot take a third dimensional object, take the surface of that object, and turn it into a second dimensional flat plane and have it be exactly the same. So you cannot have the continents of the planet on a flat surface, the flat Earth, and have the configuration of the uh, continents be exactly the same as they would be on the globe, the third dimensional sphere. So when people make a map of the Earth, a flat map of the Earth, then they take the third dimensional globe and then they try to put it onto a flat plane one way or another. And there are, of course, tons of different uh, maps out there in which they uh, take the globe and turn it into a flat map and depict the continents in uh, a relative uh, relationship to one another that is uh, kind of close to reality on the globe. But you cannot do that without distortions one way or another. So either you're going to distort the continents the classic map of the uh, planet shows Greenland being about the same size as Africa, when in reality Africa is 14 times larger than Greenland. That is a result of distorting the globe when trying to put it onto a flat plane. And then you can configure it uh, in various other ways. You can uh, take the uh, AEP map, the Azimuthal Equidistant Projection Map, which is a uh, flat circle and flat earth believers will uh, point to this as uh, evidence of the flat earth because this map is actually used by navigators. However, it is not uh, taken literally. You cannot take that flat uh, projection of the map and then assume that that is actually what the earth looks like. That will get you lost. The AEP map is not a flat earth map. It is a globe earth map that has been projected onto a flat plane in a circle as a different way of conceiving of the globe than uh, various other, for example, square maps. And so any which way that you do it, then the map is going to look different once you place it onto a plane versus a globe. Just keep that basic concept in mind. I think that we can all uh, understand that. Now I understand, of course, that navigators, sailors, do not sail out into the oceans with a flat map or with a actual globe and expect that they are going to be able to um, sail the world based just on that. You can't see anything out there um, when you are away from land, and so there are other ways of uh, navigating that you have to factor in. However, they certainly did still use maps, and they certainly did still draw maps. And the thing is, all of these maps are globe Earth maps. The distances that they show between points on the map, between the continents, between islands, is uh, correspondent with the globe Earth and not with the flat Earth. One major problem that you can hopefully understand is that, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, as you get further away from the North Pole, then the distances get more and more divergent as you compare the flat Earth versus the globe Earth. So on a globe, then once you pass the equator, going from the North heading South, you cross over the equator, and so the latitudinal lines, the lines going around the globe, start getting larger and larger as you head from the North Pole south until you get to the equator. And then at the equator, you continue going south, and those latitudinal lines start getting smaller and smaller until you get to the South Pole at the bottom of the planet. However, in a completely different configuration of, of uh, the surface of the Earth on the flat Earth uh, map, then the latitudinal lines actually start getting larger. They continue getting larger as you go south from the equator until you get to Antarctica at the uh, bottom, if you will, of the uh, planet or the outer ring of the planet, in which case the latitudinal line is a massive uh, circle that the flat earth believers would assert is actually a ice ring that uh, surrounds the planet and keeps us uh, you know basically trapped um, inside the earth and unable to see the edge of the earth because that which we call Antarctica is actually a ring around the planet and not uh, in fact a continent. But the major problem with this when you compare the two models is that 
the distances between points on the map in the southern hemisphere are going to be completely different on those two different maps. And so the uh, distances between, for example, islands in the South Pacific is going to be completely different when you compare the flat Earth versus the globe Earth. The distances are different, and if you are a sailor and trying to get from point A to point B, then you need to have the correct distances. So how is it that sailors for 500 years have been sailing the planet based on the assumption that the planet is a globe and using the corresponding globe distances between points and then are managing to find their way successfully around this planet of ours using those globe earth distances when if the earth were flat those distances would be different by factors of hundreds of percent hundreds of percent the distances would be you know five times further from one point to the other, say from the tip of South America to Australia, on the flat Earth versus on the globe Earth. And so, how is it that sailors and other navigators are able to find their way around a flat Earth, if the Earth is flat, when for 500 years, then basically everyone on the planet has believed that the Earth is a globe and the distances between points correspond with a globe Earth. If the Earth was flat, and yet people thought that it was a globe, then everyone would be getting lost. That's what it comes down to. Ultimately, the fact that navigators are successfully navigating this planet under the assumption that the Earth is a sphere, very, very successfully, tells you that the Earth must be a sphere. Because if they had it wrong, then people would be getting lost left and right. You cannot sail out into the massive oceans of our world here and have your calculations be off by even a fraction of a percent. If you're, you know, sailing off from California and trying to find Fiji, then your calculations, your navigational system must be absolutely dead on in order to be able to find Fiji or Hawaii or wherever you're trying to get to. If you are off by the tiniest little bit, then you're going to be lost out in sea. And yet this has not been happening. People have been sailing around the planet very, very successfully for hundreds and hundreds of years based on the assumption that the planet is a globe and therefore the planet must be a globe. And so my final argument against the flat earth theory is simply that the conspiracy is way too big. People have this conception in their minds that the elites, the powers that be, the authorities that are uh, controlling our planet have absolute power and just can do anything sort of with the wave of a wand or whatever, and that uh, they are simply, you know, rigging things, creating distractions and uh, false uh, technology and, and uh, computer systems and all this as a way to cover up the flat earth while uh, maintaining this illusion, this uh, worldwide belief about the uh, globe earth versus the flat earth and are simply through propaganda and manipulation of the media etc are able to fool the entire planet about uh, the shape of our earth and if you really think about this in multiple layers extrapolating out in what this would actually require to pull this off then i think that you will quickly realize that this is utterly and um, completely impossible this would require a series of coordinated, organized efforts going on that would involve millions of people, quite simply. First of all, you have the whole, you know, moon landing stuff, and I would assert very strongly that the moon uh, landings did in fact uh, occur, but uh, let's just say that the flat earth theory is, is correct, and the moon landings were um, a uh, hoax perpetrated uh, by the governments of the world in part to fool people about the uh, flat earth. You have to consider all of the technology that would have had to be um, created in order to uh, make that happen. And this is one of my arguments against uh, the moon landing hoax, only one. But you have to imagine then that the International Space Station is fake, that the moon landings did not happen, that satellites are uh, not real 
And so you have to have real people inventing all of these things because this is all very sophisticated technology simply to create a set um, that appears to be a space station. Look at all that stuff, all that technology, all those moving parts, all those flashing lights, all those um, you know, computer screens um, and things that uh, people are actually you know, manipulating and using and working with. All of that actually has to be created in order to get it into the video. And so somebody has to create this and that in itself would be highly uh, complex. You would have to have people designing all of this stuff and uh, putting it in place and setting up the set and all this. And they have to know that what they're creating isn't actually real, that it isn't actually going to um, you know, do what it is supposed to do. And so there you have you know, hundreds or thousands of people involved in simply creating these supposed false sets of um, you know, the guy that is on the International Space Station, the NASA headquarters, uh, that shows all of the people who are orchestrating the uh, supposed moon landing hoax and all of the computers there. And then you have the rockets themselves which do in fact lift off the surface of the earth. You can see video of the rocket taking off, um, propelling itself off of the surface of the earth, getting uh, you know, way the heck up there into the sky. And so that in itself had to be a very sophisticated piece of technology simply to be able to do that even if it didn't you know, ultimately go to the moon. Um, but just to, you know, blast off the earth and then go out of sight uh, of all of the people that are witnessing this, you know, on the ground, the thousands, millions of people who have seen the, uh, you know, moon landing uh, launches, the space shuttle launches, etc. And a fancy piece of machinery does in fact, you know, leave the surface of the earth and go way out there. And that would require just, you know, thousands or millions of people involved to create that technology and then you have to factor in all of the organization that would be involved. Just think of all the websites on the internet, for example. You have your you know, earthquake uh, simulation um, websites showing the earthquakes around the world. You have all of your astronomy websites with uh, you know, depictions of the earth and the moon and the sun and the stars and uh, how it all works together. And so you would have to imagine then that all of this is part of this orchestrated effort to fool the planet about the um, real shape of the earth, in which case you have to have people designing this stuff, creating all of these false programs that depict the earth um, as a globe, as part of this conspiracy to fool everybody. And so that requires, you know, more people involved in the uh, conspiracy. And so it would have to be this absolutely absurdly complicated uh, thing going on of thousands or millions of people involved in this effort to create all of this technology um, that uh, is part of the effort of confusing people about the planet in order to make these fake um, sets and set up, um, you know, the supposed International Space Station and then the people that are, uh, you know, filming it and, uh, you know, they must be part of the con in order to be there, um, you know, filming the set and everything. And then uh, all of the coordination of the, uh, you know, people who are selling this to the world, and somehow it all just fits together seamlessly. You have these thousands and thousands of people involved in this, you know, a significant uh, percentage of the uh, entire planet that is part of this, you know, perpetuating the globe Earth uh, conspiracy, even as they know that the Earth is actually flat, and somehow it all just works together, and nobody ever comes forth and says, uh, you know, I'm part of this uh, conspiracy. I'm uh, finally spilling the beans on this. The Earth is actually flat. It's known by the governments of the world. And uh, I have been part of the effort in the past and I'm coming clean um, to tell the world about this. Nobody ever does that. And so it just absolutely and completely boggles the mind to try to imagine, especially in our um, modern technological world that we live in now, um, how this could possibly be uh, orchestrated Especially when anybody can go to the you know local toy store or whatever and buy a telescope and observe the uh, moon and the um, various heavenly bodies out there for themselves, look at satellites for example for themselves, and have access to information that is just practically endless, and um, that somehow this could all be you know just part of some coordinated effort to uh, fool people and somehow it works seamlessly and for hundreds of years now, then uh, nobody has been able to poke through the mirage and actually uh, you know, notice, oh, the Earth is actually flat and we're all being fooled about the shape of our planet. 
And so there you go, that is my uh, best effort at showing um, why the flat earth theory is completely and utterly impossible and absurd. And like it or not, maybe it sounds boring, but the earth really is a sphere as it has been explained by the thousands of scientists over the last hundreds of years um, that we are on a spinning orb that is rotating around a sun that is 93 million miles away. And this then explains absolutely perfectly why it is that we live in the world that we live in and how it all works. So I hope that that makes sense. Thanks for watching. Take it easy.